Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for thanks for your patience, everyone. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Anna Johnson. I'm the content manager here at ICE Los Angeles. Uh, welcome to this installment of our guest lecture series. Um, as a reminder, this demonstration is being broadcast. So if you're watching online, please post any questions in the chat. And for our students and staff here today, please wait for the microphone so that we can all hear your questions. Our goal in this series of demos and lectures is to highlight the culinary excellence of contemporary chefs and culinary entrepreneurs. In the last few months, we've hosted Chef Diana Briscoe of Gracias Madre, and Christopher Tompkins of Broad Street Oyster Company. Our guest today is Chef Eric Klein, the Vice President of Culinary at Wolfgang Puck Catering in Los Angeles. A little bit about Chef Eric. Uh, Chef Eric Klein brought his signature culinary artistry, passionate hands-on leadership, and outgoing nature when he assumed the culinary leadership for Wolfgang Puck Catering in 2016. Chef Eric has previously held positions throughout the organization, including Chinois on Main and the flagship Spago. He spent seven years working alongside Wolfgang before leaving Spago Beverly Hills in August 2003 to take on his first business enterprise and head chef position at Maple Drive in Beverly Hills. He created rustic yet simple dishes incorporating influences from his native town of Alsace, France, earning three stars from the Los Angeles Times and received multiple accolades, including being named one of the top 10 best chefs in America by Food & Wine magazine. In January 2005, Chef Klein moved to Las Vegas to launch his first steakhouse, SW Steakhouse at Wynn, Las Vegas. In April 2006, he brought his talents to the AAA Five Diamond Bellagio Resort as executive chef of Fix, the wildly popular restaurant from the Light Group. And after embarking on a variety of roles and challenges within the fine dining industry, Chef Klein rejoined the preeminent Wolfgang Puck Fine Dining Group to take the helm of Spago, Wolfgang's first restaurant in Las Vegas. He served as the executive chef for 11 years prior to, take, prior to taking on his current role. Please, everyone, join me in welcoming Chef Eric Klein. So, so much to say and so much. Thank you very much. First of all, to have us over here, thank you for the warm welcome. And I appreciate all of you guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Michelle, for connecting. Thank you, Chef, for your hospitality. I appreciate it. This all sounds wonderful and a lot of dreams and a lot of achievements over the many, many years. And we're all standing in front of you and you're wondering, how can I be over here? How can you be in my shoes? Well, we're going to give you all these answers today. I'm going to teach you a little bit, but it starts with a couple of ingredients, and the ingredient starts with you. We're all in the hospitality. You cannot achieve nothing by yourself. You lead by leadership, but again, you're the part of the ingredient and the most important thing. Without a good ingredient, you don't have a good food, and a good ing ingredient, you don't have good quality of life or anything. So on a piece of paper, everything sounds so easy, sounds very good, allocated, best chef, do that, and in the day. And there's a reason also the chef next to me or here is Jack Leach. Chef Jack is also the chef for the commissary. Chef Jack has worked his rank up from basically entering as a cook and worked all the way up to executive chef and running the entire catering for Los Angeles. Easy. This means North and South California and as well doing all caterings for, like example, Amazon. And now maybe, maybe you know that small event called Formula One. Chef Jack leads all that. So I think... Thank you, Rob. On a person, also on a team, is not to say, again, it takes a team. You surround yourself with people constantly, where this is very important in the kitchen or anything you do, you always surround yourself with a team. You cannot attack any of yourself. Yes, we're leaders. We're leaders of certain things we do. And the food we're going to talk about in a little bit has a story behind. Also, on the people who came today with a business who help us to constantly. Yeah, first on the person, Barbara Brass. Barbara Brass has been 27 years in the company of Wolfgang Puck. Uh, she started at Spago. She went to the catering. She's the senior vice president of culinary sales. What's that mean? Well, whatever we create, she sells to the people. But this is not just selling food. It's selling a story. It's selling also an experience. And Barbara, when you work together with a salesperson, you always have a lot of great ideas, but sometimes people butcher it, don't understand what way the kitchen needs. Barbara is a great cook. She works also. She does a lot of great food, but she understands how we connect, how we talk, what's a kitchen angry, how we need, and to presentation the food is the most important thing. So that Barbara Brass does all the sales, makes the menu, helps us to dig and guide our constantly having food and conversation. There's sometimes argument always in each department, but the most important thing is hospitality always comes out. That is the tool. Without an argument, you all go normal relationship. Maybe some of you are in a relationship or marriage or any what's a certain sort. 
they have to have conversation. You may disagree, may no disagreement, you will not get anywhere. Okay, so there's something to hold for you. Next on uh, two people came is Leah and Erica. Uh, Erica. Erica's right there. Oh, right there. Erica is right there. Erica works in the marketing department, is your coordinating operation. And Leah is also doing similar and also try to find beautiful talent and understanding how to get this wonderful people who apply to the right job. And this is what we hear today. A job is not something we do. A job is a lifestyle for us. So you heard a little bit of my story. I'm going to share something with you. I'm a grew up farmer boy. Um, grew up on top of the mountains. I went to Catholic schools. I grew up with nuns. I have my ears pulled as further as you can think. But the one thing is always appreciated. I start growing up in the kitchen. Every time I went to the convent, I always saw the kitchen. And I saw there's an element to always to treat people. Everybody was always and a way of working together. You wanted something, went to the market, you know, we go to the garden and pick up cucumbers or tomatoes, cooking with seasonality. So growing up in Northeastern France, my parents were cattle rancher, my mom is a butcher. Understand you use the whole entire animal. So when chefs teaches you how to understand, how to butcher something, there's a purpose for you. You may not understanding some things today, but 20 years down the road, you understand why you took that class. You know, you may all know something and a thing with reference all ourselves with object around our life with what we're doing period of time to growing up. I'm pretty sure you guys have a cell phone, yes? Some of you may have an Apple phone, yes? You ever read the story from Chief Jobs? He said he took one day a course about understanding how to form and to write letters. And now today when you click on the top of Microsoft Word, you can change fonts, you can change things. But at the moment, he did not know why he was taking that. So cooking is the same way. Now you're going to ask questions to me. Why are you referring to a lot of things? of other people, what we do, because this is what, we get inspired. Cooking is about inspiration. You're getting inspired every day when you grow up in the morning. Your mom start making breakfast. Anybody going to tell me in this room, the food of your mom or your family is always the best? If you disagree, okay, this is your things. But I think, believe me, I can't wait to have a home good cooked meal. You know, it's always wonderful. It gives you memories. Memory you call passion. And when you grow up in the culinary world, Chef Jack, myself, or even Barbara, or any other time we try to create menus, we always try to recreate the world where we try to share with everyone. And that is the most important thing. So for today, a little bit, I want to go over a little bit certain things in a story also. In front of you today, we're going to do one of the most iconic dish besides a smoked salmon pizza. And um, we are working for a company called Wolfgang Park Catering. Before I was here, I walked in over here in the kitchen, Chef Wolfgang called, and he said, what you're doing today is the best thing you ever can do. Educate and give to others an opportunity to become what we do, and also to allow anyone to ask questions and to teach them about food. So the dish we're here, we're creating, we're working for the Wolfgang Park Company. I was just want to go back a little bit for a minute. What is Wolfgang Park Company? Wolfgang Park Company is three tiers of a company. You have fine dining, where you know all the restaurants, Spago, Cat, and all overseas. We have so many restaurants. Miroir on Sunset Street over here, Chinois on Main Street. There are so many style of restaurants in Vegas. We have Cat, we have Lupo, we have uh, Spago at the Bellagio, we have, uh, we have a lot. <laughs> So there are so many restaurants. They are under the group of the fine dining. Then you have the casual dining. It's like when you see Wolfgang go to HSM and he sells you like pots and pans. And as well, we have a little cafe all in the airport. And then we have the Wolfgang Park Catering. Wolfgang Park Catering, it goes from cross, from east to west, north to south. Sometimes you travel abroad to do an event. But our company is based and we're a sister company of Restaurant Association. What's that mean? We're globally. So what is, what's that mean for us? Well, we are part of a larger company, but one thing does not change for us is the quality we stand for. So in our chef code, you can see some of you guys have your name or anything. You have all the school name, but also maybe initial of a boss, Wolfgang Puck. The man who created a company with, with hands and hospitality, serving good food and good quality. It takes you the same amount of time to make good food and bad time and bad food. Just be respectful and we would be respectful to you. Our company is based on many things. We do from high-end catering, like you may know, Oscars, special dinner, tasting menu, test kitchen, 
Chef Jake take a small group of people, cook for the most uh, prestige watch business, and then cook something tasting where nobody had before. And then we'll go to the March party. We do hot dogs. We do burgers with, for many other things for openings. Where Barbara designed always a menu to accompli- I can give what the client wants, but also never sacrifice what we stand for. Then we'll also do Netflix. Anybody have Netflix over here? We cook for every day for the staff. How wonderful is that? How versatile we are. The menu changes every day in a rotation of six to eight weeks. Then we cook for Sony. Google. Google, we do the grab and go. We do a lot of different things on and on. Then we have business in Dallas. We have business in Chicago. We're going to take business in New York. We have business in D.C. We have all over the place. But one thing we always do is the most important thing, we cook food. But the biggest problem is with that, we need talented people. What is talent? Everybody has talent. Everybody is good for something. Not many times I'm going to say something. Everybody may say, oh, you're not good at what you do. No, you're good at what you do. But you just don't know yet. In the kitchen, you have a lot of leaders, and we always say we lead with example. And that is where in the kitchen, when I have a chef like Jake, who leads, like, uh, how much is your roster right now in the kitchen? 40. 40. And how much we had before? Uh, 80. 80. So we are half capacity, but Chef Jack is in charge to make sure you take young talent and give them an opportunity and give them an opportunity to cook food for many different events. Sometimes we have 12 events, 14 events, 16 events, 21 events. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I think that is what it is, where the talent comes in place. The people you put in place to allow you to do your job. But we need talent. We need people. We need leaders. So leadership, you only can get it if you learn it first and you lead with example. You have to do the job. And that is the most important thing. Any food we produce in our kitchen, we learn it from somewhere. We have a classic of Wolfgang. And then we create new menus. So Chef Jack has a big job also not only to hire great people, but uphold the standards, what that means to have eventually just maybe you or everybody else in this room over here to be working in a kitchen and to do from the most simple dish, the tuna cones, we're going to go over it, the smoked salmon pizza, or do a tasting menu when you say, well, that dish needs to be all pink color. That dish needs to be only that. We need to see see-through food. We're going to make an air bread. We're going to make different things where we come with the culinary things are most important. So your talent is never lost. It's just present in a different way. Our catering job is not like a restaurant job. You guys may ask, well, I'm a chef. I can cook everything. Well, some chefs are more talented than the restaurant. Some chefs are more talented than mass production. But us, when you come on top and you start learning anything, there are multi layers. We're always very good at. You have to be, have multi face. You have to organize yourself constantly to make sure you produce what's needed. Working in a restaurant, you know, your orders, you know, the people coming in, you know how many approximate seats you're going to serve, you know, you know, approximately dishes you have. You have seven appetites, seven main course. It's going to go up and down. The catering, you never know. You have a party for 50, it goes to 100. What do you do? You have a party for 50, only 25 people come. What do you do? 60,000. You have a party for 60,000 or 180,000. What do you do? How much you plan? Buying over 100,000 pounds of chicken breast, how to cook it, how to maintain it, how to make sure we don't lose for the long quantity of product we're buying, not to lose what we are. So that is the talent. So where Chef Jack is also, I want to also have him an ability to share his story a little bit because it's not about me only. I did wonderful things. I was very fortunate at a young age. I focused. I went to cooking school. I finished best of my school. And why I want to finish the best? Because I want to prove from the, the chef I was working with. I worked in three-star mission restaurants. I want to prove to everyone is an ability to be the restaurant's only number one, but ourself is number one, and all the team. So it is very important when you're very competitive and you constantly want to learn. No days you get everything in a book or you get everything on an iPhone. We had to go to the library. We had to research. And the only experience you were able to get, it was if we're allowed to go work stage on the kitchen, get the experience, working with a good chef. The chef is very good with meat. And I'm pretty sure chef knows back there what I'm talking about. When you were an apprentice, you started and you did everything what nobody wanted to do. 
You peel buckets of potatoes. You peel everything that you do. You have to go in the garden in the afternoon, pick up apples. How wonderful we have it now when everything comes to you. But we still go to the farmer's market on Wednesday in Santa Monica when you're on the markets in the region and pick up and talk to the farmers to understand where everything comes from. So the thing is very important to be a, what you do is, is what you put in every day. You know, we have good days and bad days. But, you know, growing up in Europe and growing up in, in France, it was a wonderful story. But came to America, I thought that was the best story for me. Why? Because there was a broadband of food, different ethnicity, different style, different techniques. People are very demanding. People like to have, see something different. How wonderful you can go to a restaurant. And you know, besides now, things have changed a little bit in Europe. But now when you come in 1994, the food was very different. You have great Mexican food. You have an Italian. You have Thai food. And you, all, you can learn all this amazing food to be able to make your own. The biggest challenge also when I came to America, I didn't speak any good English. And I'm, I'm still trying to do a good job on it. But it was fascinating to when you start learning the universal language of cooking, it goes everywhere. It goes around the world. And you can learn so much. It's a long time you want to learn. I work with chefs, so I know they have other restaurants and Josiah Citrine and or anything like that. I work in a small place called Rock and Rock when the first came in America. And I just, and the chef said to me, you know what, Eric? I don't want you to learn a food over here. I want you to make all the food from Europe. I want you to show everybody what's all about the food and technique. So I remember that. And then they say, you know what? This is interesting. Why do you want to eat all the food? I want to learn what they're cooking over here. But it's okay. Type some recipe, give it to a chef, how to make a goulash, how to make spätzle, how to make sauerkraut, how to make foie gras, I'm making many down of different things. And it goes on, charcuterie, sausage, terrines, bread. But then we evolve, and then we come to the world of Wolfgang Puck, where the mixing of every cuisine, but still be true, have good techniques and understanding. Follow a style of cuisine, but evolving. And then, like you see the food, he comes with French technique he did, a restaurant called Chinois, and he did a Chinois chicken salad, or he did like come up with a tuna corn, mixing good ingredients to where we are today. That dish right here in front of you, and I'm going to stop talking by myself, came, <laughs> but it's very important because I want you guys to relate in some things. The dish right here in front of you at Spago, 1998, um, Chef Wolfgang went for a trip, and Chef uh, Lee, who was a chef at the time, went for a trip and they came back and they come to us and they say, we need to figure out how to make a new dish and we need to figure out how to have something unique where everybody comes, we can serve. Because Wolfgang used to serve the smoked salmon pizza. And everybody came in, she used to have the smoked salmon pizza, smoked salmon pizza, smoked salmon pizza. So Chef Lee said, hey, no, we had a meeting every day when you come in, 9.30 in the kitchen, we had like seven sous chef in a small room. And we go over, okay, what can we do? What can we make? And you say, okay, I want, I have that ID. Chef say, I want to make a cone. Okay, what kind of cone? So Chef Sherriard say, I can make a miso twill tone. Okay, great. I wasn't a god manger some. I make a chili aioli, chef. Okay, great, perfect. Because I discovered sriracha. I was amazed about that. So, you know, that was fun. So, okay. And then Chef Lee come and had all the mise en place over here, and he would taste it and start putting, okay, we had the pickled ginger left from the lunch service. So we say, okay, add some pickled ginger in there. And somebody by mistake ordered a masago, actually, this is actually Tabico, we ordered masago for something and say, hey, put that as a garnish. And then uh, we had some bonito flakes for the sashimi plate left, and Chef said, oh, put some bonito flakes on top. And here, the dish got, got created. Because we put something together. Now, this is how I remember from the day one, you know, and I have all the recipe, all like, you know, how we made it. And then the most important thing, how can we teach that to everyone? And so that is the most important thing, sharing the recipe, sharing why we're making that dish. And every time when Barbara or Chef Jack has a party or Barbara has an event, she always say, okay, what do you want? Wolfgang Park, classical senior, tuna cones, you know, the tuna cones, spicy. Now, there are different size spago is bigger so we realize you know when you go to a cocktail party imagine you have a glass of wine or anything so we want to make it smaller so it's one bite or two bite maximum so we make our smaller so but still would not change where we are we adapting ourselves to the business as needed 
And that is the most important thing. Chef Jack, I'm going to pass it on to you for a minute. Sure. I'm, I'm going to keep it short because uh, I want you guys to ask questions because we're open books, as you guys can tell. Uh, I'm going to explain. Uh, I'm going to explain. I'm going to explain the uh, tuna cone and just go by step by step. And then uh, I'll, I'll pipe it. I'll, you know, put it in the piping bag and then Eric Klein will garnish it. And then uh, we'll talk about step by step. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free. Again, open book, full on. And then I'll talk a little bit as I'm doing it about like my story. Uh, it's pretty much the same as you guys. Trust me. Nothing special. So uh, what we have is our ahi sushi grade tuna, which is right here. It's in this deli cup. Uh, our recipes, we kind of have it down pat where we'll pack it in a small deli, which feeds about anywhere from 20 to 25 people, depending on how, 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 uh, how you squeeze it. I was trying to find a better way to say that, but you know. Uh, and then a medium deli uh, will feed about anywhere from 25 to 50. And then a tall deli rule of thumb is 100 people. So we came prepared, right? You, you know, by all means have more than, you know, uh, we have several chefs that will take this after a party and just pack it in their pocket and eat it. It's weird, but whatever, whatever, you know, it's better than stopping by McDonald's or something late at night. Uh, I started as a cook with a company. Uh, I was in culinary school. Uh, I was jumping from literally from restaurant to restaurant just to get shifts because if you're in culinary school, like typically your classes are in the morning, mine are at night. Uh, most restaurants, night service, right? I wanted to get into it, but for me, I just wanted to gain more so like the background, the technical side of like cooking, right? Like I was always an amateur cook. My dad was a restaurateur. So I've always been picked up at school and just literally did my homework in the back line, peeled onions, fried, and then would just chill outside, talk to guests, right? Uh, so I wanted to get more of like the history of culinary school, right? Of like culinary. Um, so it wasn't a classmate of mine kind of saw me and was like, Hey, would you like to go to Wolfgang Puck catering? I was like, sure. Uh, I went and they were just like, Oh, are you, you know, you're so-and-so's classmate. I was like, yeah, you guys want to see my resume? No, you're hired. Cause they had already like apparently talked about me for like a whole month of trying to get me recruited to Wolfgang Puck catering. Uh, about six months, just being a cook uh, and just kind of soaking everything in catering is completely different from restaurant. Anyone that says like, Catering is like, oh, that's easy. I kid you not, it's the most difficult. Because restaurant, you know when you're ending. You know when you're closing. You, Like Eric Klein said, you know your reservations. If you're working garmage, if you're working the grill, you kind of already know, all right, this is how many covers. I'm good. Catering is a little different. Because catering, uh, we can go to someone's house party, starts at 6, and then they can push back, and we don't start till 12. It's happened to us. We've gone to a celebrity. I won't say his name. Uh, but... We didn't, we got there at six. Actually, we got there at three because we usually go like three hours before service to set up. We didn't start till midnight. So like, you know, it happens, but it was a good experience. I've learned not to pick up those shifts. Uh, but within six months, uh, I got promoted to junior sous chef in training. Uh, that was literally put through the ringer of just kind of learning every station and kind of the ins and outs. Food is the easy part. Honestly, food is the easiest part. Because there's right now modern technology, right? We can go on our phone, we can Google, what is a scallion? What is paella, right? Like all kinds of things. My first uh, first day working event, paella for 2,700. Okay, sure. I don't, what, what's going on? What is that? Honestly, I had no idea. And I'm running around nervous, grabbing saute pans in a built kitchen at LA Live, looking for saute pans. How do I cook paella for 2,700? That's nearly not enough stove. Like I need a whole brigade. If it already came cooked, all I had to do was just saute shrimp and peas and garnish. That was, I was stressing for no reason. And they were giving me terms, 22 out, 22 back up, 22 out of what? I don't understand. What, what am I doing? Uh, but chefs were just kind of teasing me and they knew, they knew that I had a background. So they put me through a wonderful ringer, which I'm so greatly appreciative. Uh, but anyway, uh, after sous chef and training within a year, promoted to sous chef. After a year of that and traveling, then it was like, okay, now you're a salary sous chef. Uh, after another year, then it was, okay, senior sous chef, you're going to go help open restaurants and go open catering. Eric Klein sent me to India right after the Oscars. I had no sleep. Uh, so it, it's been fun, actually. I can't even complain. There's a lot of hard work, but it's hard work in anything you do, right? Just like a normal job, there's going to be some grueling times. But I think we spend more time laughing, goofing off. Uh, not, you know, sorry, but we do. It's the truth because food is easy. It's the easiest thing ever. 
Um, it's mainly just kind of understanding the company, uh, the purpose of it, right? Barbara Brass will put something on the menu that for me, I might go, what is that? Or how exactly are we going to do that? And it's so easy for us to get upset, right? And just see like brisket for, you know, 128,000 people. No, why would you put that on the menu? But then for me, it just makes the clockwork, right? And started going, okay, like how do, how would I prep that? And how would I hold that? Like how many pounds? I mean, brisket shrinks like 50% when we smoke it. So, you know, if I need to order for 120, I probably should order for about 240, right? And then there's a cost to it. So for me, it's constantly learning building i've i've from a cook i've built my relationship with barbara like full on complete 360 of like gaining appreciation of even her side of the business right getting business for us during the pandemic like we we're trying to sell you know anything and anything i mean we went into like disposable business we'll sell you you know two ounce pc cups i mean anything just to just to get people to come to work uh so for us it's been a challenge, but it's been a fun challenge because we not only were able to reinvent the wheel a bit just to be successful, but build our inefficiencies and then kind of go into culinary schools and grab, you know, new talent. Majority of my sous chefs now, I would say six of them out of the 20 that I have uh, were green two years ago. And now they're full on, you know, they're, they're a little scary when I tell them, you know, here's a party of a thousand, go prep. But they love it. They love the challenge. It's like a family vibe. I will never set anyone up for failure, right? I'll take time a whole week. We'll go over menus. We'll talk about like, what's your vision, chef, right? And then what's my vision? And then he'll say something that's really complicated. And I'll think we'll make that easier, right? You know, just for the sake of my own, you know, madness. Uh, but so again, like I have a small, simple, simple story. Nothing crazy. Culinary school. Kept my head down. Worked. Listen. Yes, chef. No, chef. That's pretty much it. It's a great uh, story for what Jake said, but the one thing you can hear from both sides, we're saying the same thing. And I think, you know, we're all in front of you over here as a team with like, you know, I know there's a reason Barbara came today also as well, is, is, is a partnership, you know? And I think you guys need to understand, be humble, be kind, be nice, be respectful. Everything will come. You guys all ask you questions. Okay, what is the, the thing where you can see all these professional chefs all these great restaurants, the catering chefs, or anything what Jack does, hard work pays off. Respect pays even more. And so I think it's very important when you see everyone to work so hard will become. I mean, I've been 30 years in the United States, and I'm very proud of what I did. But no sacrifice is no reward. You heard that sometimes in movies. You heard that from people speaking. You heard from leaders or anything. But it really pays off. And working together in the kitchen to us, yes. We don't have brain surgery, but we do food. But food can be amazing. Food can be in many certain things. You have different styles of techniques. So do you're good in butchering? You're good at cooking fish. You're good at to make bread. You know, you guys have all these programs you're learning right now. Where is your niche? Why do you think you're good? Try different things. It's okay to fail. Failing is the equal of success. Three lessons. Huh? Three lessons. Three lessons. Yes, absolutely. And I failed so many times. Yes, he has. And and you know what? And this is funny where I think I open myself for, for criticism. When I have an idea and I go to Jackie, Jake, I want to do that or Barbara. And she's like, you're crazy. And then we come up with something right here where one day I did, okay, I'm going to do extruded pasta. We do it for the Oscars and suddenly Barbara has a good idea. I'm going to sell that for a thousand people. And then you come look at me and say, how are you going to do that? It's okay. We do a thousand. We do 100. It's the same thing. We do a couple of stations. We split it up. But still make extruded pasta. Here's a little small machine goes on countertop, 2,000 grams of semolina, 560 grams of water. They're going to forget all And pinch of salt. And you mix it. No, but again, this is where the thing says, where I work, can we make something from scratch? Anybody comes to that table and you have a big giant Parmesan wheel, and it's the most simple pasta where you can come. Everybody says, I cannot be the next El Bulli. Forget about that. The one thing is the most important. Just focus on simple things make you happy. For example, I have a cacio de pepe pasta. It's about pepper. It's about the pasta. It's about the cheese. That's it. Three elements. We sell it for thousand people. People come. My God, the pasta is so delicious. What do you put in there? And you're looking at people and you say, I just cooked it in front of you. I just make love to the food. <laughs> but I'm not joking. And that is exactly what we do. And I think, you know, that is the most important thing. So never forget that. You know, it's about the quality of food you prepare. So I'm going to go over right now, like right here, the tuna cones. So 
the tuna, like Chef Jack explained, is the tuna, fresh tuna. Chili aioli. Chili aioli. The, you don't need a lot. You don't need a lot. Why we packed and prepped so much, I have no idea. But <laughs> you don't need a lot. It's literally a tablespoon just because tuna, one, it's organic, right? So the more moisture you put in, even salt, it starts to bleed out. Even from a guest component, if you pick this up, you certainly don't want it to drip, right? You don't want it to drip on yourself. Use, oh, which, congrats, it's a clean chef coat. Normally, Chef Klein will always have stains just because, you know, for some reason, you know. I taste the food. You taste the food. I taste the food too, but. <laughs> Pickled ginger, we make it in-house. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I, will, I won't lie to you. There's times when we do a large party, we'll source it just because Big picture, do I really want to have two cooks making pickled ginger, like five gallons of it? No, that's not, labor, you know, it's not cost effective, right? But for smaller parties, yeah, it's easy. We have a recipe. Here you go, right? And it's something for us to see cooks because I was there at one point where we need to be able to read recipes and we need to be able to follow the recipe down to a T and then be able to take that recipe and then expand upon it, right? Like, can I, each recipe is almost like a route. It's like a, like a map. It, it's just going to get you from point A to point B. But different applications, you know the base of this recipe. Okay, now you can play with it and have fun. And, you know, maybe I can do blue, right, using some pea powder. Maybe I can go red and add beets. Something, something so simple can literally blow people's minds away. It's crazy. Like, I just added something to it. And they're like, oh, my gosh, never seen this before. Well, sure. Okay, here you go. Enjoy, right? Well, as long as it tastes good. We have a few chefs that like to go a little overboard, which is fine, right? Be, be creative. But, you know, I, that's usually my role where it's to rail them back in a little bit. Sometimes I'll go a little off handle and I'll tell Barb, hey, I want to do beet tortelloni pasta without really thinking ah, beet's really earthy. So then you kind of have to play with it and play with it and spend nights doing it. And now, you know, we're going to do a, an event, a movie uh, that's pink everything. And now we have this beet tortelloni, which he's not happy with, but it's OK because it's my menu. Uh, after that, scallion whites, uh, when I was a cook. I would cut a tall deli of this for my chefs, mainly this one right here on my left, would take it and say, oh, nice, and then throw it away and go, it needs to be thinner. But what? now, we're changing the culture, right? Because back in the days, it was yes, chef, no, chef, thank you, chef, right? Great, I just spent 30 minutes cutting this, and he doesn't like it, it's in the trash, cool. Yes, chef, I'll do it again, right? I'm, in a way, fortunate to learn that way, but I know that now, Things are kind of different, right? Before it was always like very just touch and go, touch and go, 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 go. And now being a part of that and also my background of being a kindergarten teacher, uh, I've learned there's different ways that we can teach people. Not to throw you under the bus, but I, you know, I love that discipline because I got it from my father. But now we've learned like if I had just taken five minutes just to show them properly then that five minutes would save them and also me waiting for another hour for a tall deli of scallion whites, right? Typically, we always try to like show them, show everyone a demo, and then we move on because as an executive chef, like there's so many of you guys, right? Like this classroom, I'm sure even with your, your instructors, you get a demo and then you move on. If you mess up, it's okay. I've learned, it's okay, it's fine. Could we use it? No, not for this application, but I'm sure we can use it somewhere else. I'm sure we can cook it down and pull it into something else, right? Also, big picture, does it really need to be like super thin? I mean, it's gonna get mixed in here. It's gonna go in here, but you would say no. Like, no, it doesn't matter. It kind of does, because from a guest perspective, when they eat it, do they want this thick piece of onion that hasn't been rinsed into their teeth? No. So it's trying to teach all sides, like how would you want to eat it? I usually tell everyone, how would you cook for your mother or your, or your father or your parents? Or how would you cook for your girlfriend, boyfriend? How would you want them to appreciate this, right? You put in the work, you want them to appreciate it as well. If it's like, if you do it with no effort, then that's what you're going to get. You're going to get no effort in return. So I've always tried to like preach that, especially with any students, culinary staffing, temps, anyone that's green. I just try to implicate that. So that way they understand the full scope of just a tuna cone, not just all right, sure, that's it, there you go, done. But it's kind of understanding. Sure, client will tell you the history, which is great, it's great. But I want you to understand this is gonna be given to someone and that's gonna blow their mind. So you should take some pride in it, right? We should take pride in all our work and what we do from if it's just peeling onions to if it's creating you know, clear bread that client wants to reinvent and I have to spend all night thinking about it. It worked though. It did, it did. And it guess did. who we cooked it for? Wolf. Chef Wolfgang. 
And he said, oh, interesting. How did you come up with that? And I said, well, put it on my menu. We start with a recipe. We talk to each other. We came up. The first batch came out was not good. The second batch came out great. And he said, okay, good. Let's work on more on that. And that is basically us able to figure out how to work things together. And it's very, very important. So also on that right here, one ingredient right here, we talked chili, chili aioli. But we made that dish too as well. We added a little sushi soyo. What is sushi soyo? I guarantee you, anybody go to a sushi place over here? I to this day don't know what he means when he says sushi soyo. I always look at him and go, sushi soy? So to this day, when he says sushi soyo, I always think it's his accent, but legit, there is a sauce. It's sushi soyo, and it's it's not it's not him, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> and so what we are able to create when you go to a sushi place, you always mix the wasabi and soy sauce, you know, for like adding new rolls or anything. So we figure out a mixture, uh, three to one, to make that wasabi texture and the soy sauce flavor, basically. And we added that in the kick because we want to add soy sauce and a little kick of wasabi in there for up run the flavor. And that was the, the element of one we added in the last minute on making the, the dish. And uh, so, yeah. So we're going to put in a pastry bag. We're going to pack it. And then we're going to garnish it with like little tabico and bonito flakes. Bonito flex is a fish, um, bonito, where basically the fish is cut, it's similar to the like amberjack or hamachi if you want to. And it's basically be salt, cured, steamed, smoked, and dried. And then shaved very, very thin. You can use dashi with that. You can do a lot of different things, shiromiso, a lot of different things. Oh, did you want to taste it? Do you trust me? Okay. Sure. If I don't trust you today, I'm going to... I guess I'm off tomorrow. Barbara, you have anything to say? Come over here. Don't be shy. This is Barbara Brass, guys. Come over here. Don't be shy. Come in the middle right here. You can speak between both microphones. I could not do my job without them. And one of the things that you should also know is that I spoke with Michelle the last time I saw her is that coming out of culinary school doesn't always mean that you end up in lights. You can end up in sales. You can end up in operations. Having a culinary background, which I do, uh, makes me uh, a little on the legal side in the sales because you understand what the chefs are going through. You've made a partnership with them. What we do is incredibly collaborative. Um, so they can't do what they do without me. I can't do what I do without them. And we create a family atmosphere in our kitchens and in our, in our, in our industry. Um, we lead our industry because of how innovative and excellent our, our staff is and our kitchens are. I've worked for Wolfgang for almost 27 years, uh, and I've learned so much from our team. Uh, kitchen line, the very first time I met with Wolfgang, uh, we were catering an event for craft food. It was on the Santa Monica Pier, 1,200 people. This was 26 years ago, um, and they were doing a symposium on innovation, and thank you. They were doing a class on innovation and they wanted Wolfgang to speak about it, but he was unavailable and they asked if he would do a video to welcome the guests. And they were going to film him at Spago. I'm not good with technology. Me neither. I just could. There you go. At six o'clock in the morning, they were going to interview Wolfgang and he asked me if I would be there to give him information on uh, the event in case he needed it. And we sat down at the table and I sat down behind the interviewers and he, the first question out of his mouth, out of the interviewer's mouth to Wolfgang was, Wolfgang, what is your philosophy about food? And he looked them square in the eye and he said, oh, I buy the best ingredients money can buy and I don't fuck them up. <laughs> and I fell off my chair and then asked him to rephrase it. But for the last 26 plus years of my career, that has been his philosophy. He takes the best ingredients he takes the ingredients and lets them shine through what they are. Peas are peas. Tuna, everything that they've done, that's the best quality ahi that you can buy. The sriracha aioli is the best quality chili aioli that can be made. The produce that we buy, and I tell this to our customers, is from the best purveyors out there. We search and we go through and we take that ingredient and we treat it respectfully. One of the things that I tell our customers is that we are nose to tail, not just on the animals, but on the vegetables. 
things like taking a piece of salmon that you're going to serve with roasted carrots, nothing wrong like adding a carrot top pesto to go with it. Um, so it's treating ingredients respectfully, but it's treating your teammates respectfully too. I respect what these guys do. They respect what I do. And it's a very, very rare situation that front of house and back of house are symbiotic. Um, and we've learned that the pandemic brought us, as Jake mentioned, closer together, learning things about one another. Jake and I would have 5 a.m. conference calls because I knew that that's when he was coming into the kitchen and that's when he was quiet. And I knew that come 7.30, 8 o'clock when his team was coming in, he didn't have the time to talk to me. And he was going to go nonstop all day long. For me, it meant getting myself up a little earlier to respect the schedule that my chef had and to be able to speak to him and communicate with him on a day that wasn't messing with his schedule and kept him on track. And so mutual respect in the kitchen, mutual respect for what other people do is a foundation for how you make it work. I'm happy to take questions for you. I do. I, I work with these guys. I design all Ask the away. menus for our, uh, our events and we do events like Jake said for five to 10 in somebody's home all the way up to we do an annual event for Amazon in Las Vegas for as many as 30,000 people. And we're about to embark on our largest event for, as they mentioned, F1 um, catering for four days in the grandstands for 64,000 people a day. Um, and so these guys have their job cut out for them. So I'm going to open up to questions to Thank anybody you. for Jake, Enough, for please. myself, for Eric about the business, the industry, the kitchen, anything. I'm going to pass on the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds Thank you so much for coming. Um, my question is, is, of course, you're not just creating massive amounts of food for people, but super high quality food. Um, so how do you think about and what are kind of your best practices around scaling quality that is going to kind of maintain the Wolfgang Puck brand and name, um, but also be able to serve, you know, tens of thousands of people for multiple days? So I'm going to we're going to answer that in three in three phases because we're three of us right here. I'm going to start one thing to say, first of all, it starts where it begins. Relationship and vendors, farmers, understanding. Don't put something in the menu you cannot produce. That's the rule number one. That is, for me, where we currently understand where our relationship and the people we allow, and I have many stories, and I'm going to, after we're going to answer your questions, I'm going to share a story with you where, for example, Food and Wine Magazine went and wrote a story about it. But the thing is, the quality of the ingredients let do the work itself. Yes, we buy a pallet of carrots. Yes, we buy thousands of pounds of, of certain things. But the one thing never changes, never changes is the quality we put and understanding. Source the quality for the food where we will produce. Check. As far as like large scale, large scale quantities, uh, it's tricky because you never want to get too ahead because we respect the food and we don't want to put in all this effort and prep when we know like the event is, let's say we have an event on Friday and it's Wednesday. We're not going to touch it until maybe Thursday. And that's kind of like maybe the braising sauces, any prep that can hold. And then the following day is like things that literally we need to start getting on, right? Like cooking, anything, cooling down, right? following like, you know, our safety guidelines of like cooling temperature logs, like making sure everything's cool. Then day of, day of is the most exciting thing. I used to hate it, but now I love it. It's like organized chaos. Everyone knows what to do and everyone's just like running around. Picture like a freeway on-ramp where everyone's just going in. Everyone knows what to do. There's a full on production, like, you know, prep list that everything's highlighted, organized. Um, and that's just the best way of just planning, organizing, and then trusting in your chefs. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have quite a few mentors in our own kitchen. Uh, you know, Eric Klein is one. We have another that's been with Wolf since for, I don't know, like 30 years, started as a dishwasher. One day the butcher quit and, you know, Polly saw, saw it, saw a need. And since then, like, Polly has taught me anything and everything to cook under the sun. He's like the glorified cook. Um, I've never had practice with alligator. He knew how to break down alligator and we cooked it for a wedding. So and it's a question from the sales. Perspective. Yeah. I asked, how do you do? And I, I 
constantly will get a no but. So I'll get a no, but we can do this. So um, would I sell this to 5,000 people? No. But is there a version of this that can be sold to 5,000 people? Yes. And so it's communicating amongst our team as to my job and our sales team's job is to set us up for success with the customer. And where we bicker sometimes is as a salesperson, it's my job to straddle a very difficult line of advocating for my customer and advocating for my kitchen at the same time. So I want to give the customer what they want, but I want to set them up for success. So on an event like Amazon for 30,000 people or F1 for 64,000 people for four days, and I asked Jake to write the menu. It was what he felt comfortable knowing that he could deliver on for that number of people and not putting us in a situation where we can't maintain the level of integrity that we would normally maintain. So let's go back where you asked a question about quality and product. A long time ago, um, I was asked to create a dish for Food and Wine magazine. And here it comes where here, you work very hard, you have a recognition. And I came to a dish and when I opened the restaurant, a couple of wine guys came to me and say, oh, I do this, I do wine, I do ice wine, I do this, and I'm from there. And being a farmer to a farmer, the gentleman starts talking to me, and he's like, oh, my goodness. I created this beautiful ice wine. Joking. Guy left, went home back to Canada, wherever his farm is. And he listened and he did vinegar. He sent me the first batch and the vinegar called minus eight. So our things, I went and I say, and he said, Eric, make a dish with that. So I made the melon and prosciutto with ice wine. So the, the thing to understand the product and the quality, work with the farmers, understand, allow them to become a part of you. They're part of you, they're part of them. You know, we, every time we do on the menu and you see sometimes you go to fancy restaurant, they put all the farms, but is it really coming from there? You know, same thing, we have a, a, an item with a glass for the last 40 years on the menu, Chino Farm chopped salad. And what is that dish? Well, when Chef Wolfgang started going to the farmer's market, there was not very one up here. So he went to Chino Farm, down in um, Rancho Cucamandras, if I say it the right Rancho way. Rancho Santa Fe. Santa Fe, yes, thank you. And he <laughs> went out there, so she finished my words. And he start getting some product and the product, the farmers are start making stuff, more stuff for him, start planting white corn, start planting different elements and strawberries or anything. And the farmer goes, okay, no problem. I produce all that. Well, if you're a farmer, you know, in the early days, hey, everything is ripe to go. They put in a truck, they brought it to Spago. What right. do you want right. to do with like so many cases of um, corn? What do you want to do so many cases with carrots, celery and and on and on. So Chef Wolfgang said, I'm going to make a chopped salad, Chino chopped salad. Awesome. And um, so now for all these years, the chopped salad is one of the senior traditions who goes to a lot of catering, but it's also a lot of hand chopped vegetables, carrots. Of course, we simplify it because certain ingredients are not available. But able to work on the farm and if something's happened, people bring to you and the farmers, like you ask for quality and product. Can we do chopped salad for 5,000 people? Yeah, but it's difficult because you have to think about every single thing. It's a lot of cutting. A lot of cutting, a lot of labor. But well, we okay. also now have That's if we and tell him we have a party for 5,000 people, he will cut the vegetables for us. And that's the building of a relationship with your vendors for this event that we're doing for 60, 70,000 people. Our vendors have come to us and offered us the use of their refrigeration in their facilities in Las Vegas, their trucks and their storage, because it becomes a win-win for everybody. It's a trickle-down effect of that party for 64,000 people, 250,000 covers for the four days. It supports the disposable company, it supports the produce company, it supports the dairy company, it supports the farmers, it supports so many different businesses that they don't all step up and come together to help you out with something like that. 
he can't achieve the quality goal that we want. Thank you. Any questions? More questions. Let's go. Sit on. We'll keep it short this time. I was just curious if you did anything to the tuna before we saw it today, if it's just chopped or if you've cured it or anything. Uh, this one is just diced. Uh, we literally ordered a tuna loin just for you guys, uh, and I had my butcher dice it. Typically, in the beginning, we would take all, like, the belly and all the scraps, and we would just scrape it. We'll, we'll just keep going. And we would just scrape it because we would save the loin for all of our sashimi and ahi dishes and things like that, so... Uh, today, Klein's just going to pay for the tuna that I'm going to charge him for. <laughs> or Eric is going to charge it to our marketing budget. <laughs> there we go. We'll put on marketing. Any other questions? That'll be some harder questions. Yes, okay. Give them more. I think people are hungry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I... Whoever can answer this. Sure. Um... If you were to start thinking of a completely new dish, what would be your first thought, your starting point on a new idea? What's the season? That's my first idea. Like, what's the season? Are we in summer? Are we in winter? Are we in fall? Because that already will let me know where I'm going to go. Like, what type of pro like vegetable, what produce, sauce, all that ties into play before I even think of a dish. What's the season that this event is for? Or even like right now, my project is creating a fall menu, a complete new fall menu that I've been working on. Sorry, I spilled the beans. Uh, but for me, it's like, okay, what can, what, what's in fall? And then talking to like our purveyors, our farmers, hey, I wanna do pink radicchio. I know it's only in the summer, but can we grow it in the fall, right? This is, yeah. What is the expected people they plate? Are they standing and eating? Are they holding? How many people is it for? Is it at night? Is it going to be humid out? I have a client that a client that asked in the middle of the summer here for a giant crocodile for their wedding. No, because the minute that that crocodile hits the humidity, the sugar is all going to melt on the table. So you have to think about where you are, the outside, the inside, the ten people or twelve thousand people. So you have to think of what those institutions got to answer the question. If it were me. I've had every single client of mine has at some point in their life asked me, what's the dip signal? So what the next two? Did that answer your question? Yeah, that answers my question. One oh. thing I want to add on that also for sure. Okay. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I deal every day, you see? If you hear me say, get off the freeway, that's me telling him, land and let's let's move on. We do make the best Yeah, please ask the question. Um, you were mentioning like a trip to say India. Yeah. Uh, for I, I was wondering what kind of information, what kind of experiences you're pulling from that that you're bringing back uh, to working in your kitchen. Okay, so I'm gonna, gonna answer, answer, I'm gonna answer that question. Go for it. So. I'll answer it. So <laughs> traveling, it's great because that was my first time going to India, uh, Mumbai in particular. Uh, and it's just, Mumbai is known for like street food. Uh, so for us, it's to kind of just see, you know, oh, how are they, how do they do it here? What's, you know, it's different when you look at it on Instagram and you see like chai masala, but like, how is it done there? Right. Uh, but I'm going to, I'm not going to lie to you. That's a poor example, uh, India, just because I absolutely learned nothing. Uh, it was a great experience, nonetheless. It's 134 degrees in the daytime, 100 degrees at night, uh, cooking on the floor, learning, you know, there's different rules, how they do things there. We were literally just hired as, like, for show. People took pictures, uh, but did they eat? No. We prepped for a whole week of just trying to, like, get ahead because in Mumbai, like, I think the pastry department, they were literally prepping in a university, like, a, literally a pastry college. Uh, whereas the savory, uh, we had a built kitchen. Uh, we had no regulators on the butane on the stove. So the moment you turn it on, it would just skyrocket. Um, so we kind of learned how to maneuver and adjust. I would say pivot. That's the best handling every type of curveball. You'd be surprised. Fresh ingredients in Mumbai. You know, um, I really don't eat salads, but I was 
dying for some type of lettuce green. My diet was literally limes, anything covered in a skin, limes, bananas, and Red Bull, which is bad. Don't don't do don't drink Red Bull. So that was my diet. So I think you know our experience, and I think you know also it's for you to understand. You go to places you never know to expect. You always think you base yourself what you know, what you see, what you have experienced before. The best advice I can give you when you travel, you know, chef on the road, you know what you have the guideline. You can ask so many questions you want. You can go to like, you know, a different country and you can ask, oh, I need a stove or anything. A stove for them may be something different as your stove it is. I don't know if anybody know, for example, specular where you say, in this part of this country or anything like that, a dish area is not three compartment sink made like a sanitizer, pee wash or anything. No, it's literally it's people thinning. Is a uh, um, a tile floor where people are basically sitting on, on on a milk tray or something and washing pots and pans, rinsing it and passing it along. Whatsoever is it bad? No, but this is what they know. This is what are the experience. Whatsoever, us us chef and organizer, what we do, you make the most out of it. And I think it's a lot of pre planning to understanding how to basically we did not sacrifice what we want to do. And hope that answer your question. I'll say this. I do remember uh, the entire menu was vegan. So for us, it, it made us kind of open our eyes on our vegan program and our dishes to go, this is kind of boring, like, you know, cauliflower steak, like that's boring. So for us, it did challenge us on, you know, creating new dishes that would engage, uh, you know, clientele to like want to eat and go, oh my gosh, like, what is that, right? Uh, but unfortunately, they didn't, they didn't eat, unfortunately. We were just there for, hey, Wolfgang Puck's here, unfortunately. Any other questions? Another question? My question is for Barbara. I was wondering how, could you tell us a little bit more about how you got into your position and building trust in the industry? I went to law school and then I decided it wasn't for me. Um, and I had fallen in love as a child. My parents would tell the story that when I was five years old, they came into the kitchen one day and I pulled all the kitchen chairs around the cabinets and I had gone up and climbed up and I was flipping on them. And so they knew I had a love for food. Every time I got the opportunity to, I wanted to go to a fancy restaurant, even as a child. And then when I decided not to become a lawyer, I went to work for a company called Marriott, uh, which is a very large hotel company. It was a very entry level position with them and their family dining restaurant in the lobby. I did everything from hostess to room service operator. They had a liaison with, uh, and this is back on the East Coast, they had a liaison with the Culinary Institute in Hyde Park that they had a program for aspiring chefs, cooks, managers, similar to the program that they have at Cornell. Um, and I asked my manager if I could attend and be part of that program. Um, from there, I went into the fine dining restaurant upstairs, which was a revolving rooftop fine dining restaurant. And then in 1992, um, I moved out here to LA with Marriott. I was staying with them and then kind of made my way from Marriott to Hyatt. And then Hyatt, when I was working for them, I got a call from a gentleman uh, that was a company called Restaurant Associates, which is the Patina Group out here now. Uh, to do sales at the LA Music Center and the opportunity to move up here. Wolfgang was the celebrity chef on the Oscars. And I just completed my 28th Oscars. Um, and I met Wolfgang in an elevator, um, joking around with my former boss. And he literally looked over and said, I don't understand why you don't work for me. Um, and that was the beginning of my story with him. Um, and uh, I, I can tell you the story. <laughs> I don't know anybody that I'll have for to lament my feet in this cement here. My very first event, which was this incredibly difficult woman in uh, in Beverly Hills. Uh, Wolfgang knew she was an incredibly difficult customer and sent me in there to handle the event for her. And the minute I met her, we quit. We just like me, I liked her. She invited me to sit down with her the day of the event at her living room when the guests were coming to have a glass of champagne with her. Um, and that's to my uh, not knowing. Wolfgang was in the kitchen cooking and he was absolutely steaming. Um, 
she is while I'm uh, slaving over hot stove. She's sitting there having a glass of champagne. She called my boss. He called my boss at the time and said, fire that bitch. Um, throughout the dinner, I sat with the family. They invited me to sit down. They invited me to everything at the table. And at nine o'clock the next morning, she called Wolfgang and I was also over this getting fired. She called Wolfgang and said, I just want to thank you for dinner last night. The food was excellent. But the greatest thing you've ever done is hire that girl. Because I'm going to make sure that I introduce her to every single one of my friends, husband's companies. I was so nervous about this event. And she was so hospitable. She made me so comfortable. She made me so easy that I enjoyed the event so much. I will never do an event with anybody else. He then called my boss and said, no, never mind. <laughs> I still do events for her 27 years later. And I'm embarking on the catering for her granddaughter's bat mitzvah this coming December. And so it's kind of a story of, I always say we're cradle to grave. <laughs> all along the way, but I now, from having been here so long, families that I work with, that I've done their kids' bar mitzvahs, their weddings, and now their kids that I've done their bar mitzvahs and their weddings, having babies. And babies. So the moral of the story is, be hospitable. be hospitable, but again, what we take away from that, in that moment, you know, do the right thing, but again, you know, uh, come from the kitchen side, you know, what Wolfgang did and the things, we all want to do the right thing for the customer. And Bob went and did the right thing for the customer. We did the right thing in the cost for the customer too. But it's amazing. I know I'm not asking you to have a glass of champagne with every customer. Don't get yourself in trouble. But just understanding, be the liaison, be the support, be the understanding. It is about everything you do is about hospitality. I think one of the things that people admire most about working is that he goes out on the floor in the restaurants and he touches every single table. He makes a connection to people. Eric, my favorite place to put Eric. He's the vice president of Colony, senior vice president of Colony for a company. He should he sits in the little chair up here, but he doesn't act like that. My favorite place to put Eric is at that happy cafe station, cooking pasta because not only is it what he loves, but the customers feel the love coming off of him, and he engages with the customer. And some of the most important things that you can do in your careers is engage, whether it's engaging with each other, engaging with your chef, engaging with your customer, engaging with your vendors, engaging with the menu. Like people feel the love that goes into, you know, people always say, what's the greatest ingredient? It's love. And it really is. And you can taste the love in our food. You can see it in our service. You can see it in every way that our company operates. And you, in the beginning, when I started with you guys, when we started here today, I say you guys are part of an ingredient. And ingredient is the hospitality. So I think it's very important to constantly understand. But I think we don't want to bore you. We change things a little bit around a little bit today to make sure. <laughs> but the most important thing, what I want you to do, guys, is to ask us questions to allow you to become eventually and find the directions you need to do where you can grab on and say, hey, if I work hard and I work with these people and I have a philosophy and I have a respect for what you do, a standard and a, a foundation, way. it gets you where you want to be. So, no, just uh, ginger, do the no, right thing. Feel free. Take your spoon, take your finger. Taste it. No finger. No finger. Thank you all. Thank you, chefs. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Wolfgang Puck Catering, for an educational venture through Wolfgang Puck Catering. Thank you all.